In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Sprasnikam! We celebrate the Mystical Supper today. There's a number of things to say about the Mystical Supper, and it's funny enough because one of the when I was in college, one of my favorite courses in college, I think it was my first year in college, we did kind of like a math theory class. And it was all about, uh, well, the theories of mathematics. And I had to write, I don't know what it was, you know, ten, a six to 10 page paper on the um, relativity of time. So I was like reading uh, the, you know, the, it's, it's an easy book, the Stephen Hawking book on time and whatnot, and wrote this whole paper. But what's incredible is like, as I was reading it, I was starting to understand, you know, this concept of like, that I had never really grasped or understood that time is relative to speed and to gravity and uh, to uh, space, you know? And th so they have all these analogies that they use and, and examples and even the fact that if you get two basically atomic clocks and you put one down near sea level and you put one up on top of a mountain, uh, and you run them for some indeterminate period of time, they will actually begin to be whatever it is, like one second off. Because due to the gravitational force of the Earth, it changes how time moves. What's interesting about this, though, has nothing to do with that, but what's interesting about this is the fact that when God does things, He does things inside of time, meaning that He does them at actual periods within history that actually took place, and yet he himself is outside of time and that he sees all time as one. Uh, in fact, even what's wild is in the prayers that we read during the liturgy, we talk about the cross, the tomb, all it, we actually pray all these things that have come to pass for us. The cross, the tomb, the resurrection on the third day, the ascension into heaven and the second and glorious coming. So the priest actually prays for a future event as if it's a past event. Because when we're in the liturgy, technically speaking, we are outside of time. In fact, one of the uh, theological points that I often speak about is that people often think that we have icons on the wall because it's like that the saints and the angels are coming down to earth and that they're worshiping with us. And this is, this is completely false. The understanding from the Holy Fathers is that the church itself is actually elevated up into heaven and the church itself goes outside of time actually you could say goes into eternity uh, and that all of the saints and the angels that we see in the icons and also the saints and angels that people actually see during the liturgy are because the church is actually elevated up into paradise during the divine liturgy and so it is that when we read and, th and these are some points that we have to understand number one is when Christ says, do this in remembrance of me, he's not saying, do this in your present day as a reminder to something that happened previously. He's saying, do this to remember me, to bring me to recollection, to be present with me. And this argument today that you kind of see, obviously, in kind of internet forums and whatnot, you hear from Protestants, and we live in a Protestant culture, is that we are doing that the that the, the, the Protestant communion service is a remembrance of what happened in ancient times, and that there's nothing mystical going on in it, which is true. We affirm that we do not believe that the Holy Spirit comes down either for the Protestants, the Roman Catholics, the Oriental Orthodox, or anyone else. There is no one else who calls down the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit actually descends upon the gifts except for the legitimate priesthood that is only found in the canonical Orthodox Church. So, you know, a little while ago I was talking with this uh, Protestant pastor, maybe this a year ago or so, and he said, oh, he was talking to me about how the gifts of the Holy Spirit have ceased and whatnot, and these miracles don't exist. And I said, I agree with you. It's true. There are no miracles, there is no grace in the Protestant Church. The Holy Spirit is not acting. I said, we agree on that. Then he didn't really know what to say. And I said, but we don't believe that for ourselves. We obviously know the Holy Spirit is still active. And we have saints and we have miracles and we have all these things that still take place. But you're right. For you, it is not active. The grace of the whole, buying a, buying a liturgical book and, and putting on vestments does not make someone a priest. 
The only thing that makes someone a priest is the ordination through the laying on of hands by a canonical bishop. This is what we have in apostolic succession. If anybody says, well, this apostolic succession, is, listen, there's two main, you could say, uh, 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 what we would call apologetics or, or uh, defenses for this. Number one, Christ says clearly to the apostles, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This is only given to the apostles. This is confirmed by the fact that all of the church fathers within the, you know, easily first three to five hundred years, all affirm this fact. There's no deviation on this. The ability to bind and loose sins is not given to all Christians. It is only given to those who've been ordained through the laying on of hands. Furthermore, when we talk about this activity of the calling down of the Holy Spirit upon the gifts, when we reference the mystical supper, what are we referencing? There's a couple of concepts. Number one, we're referencing the fact that Christ's priesthood is the priesthood that is received by the priest in the canonical Orthodox Church. Right? We had that. And I say this because some people are confused about this. They see uh, charismatic people like there's this fellow Mari Mari, Mari or whatever on, on social media. This man is not, he's not even a Christian. He's a Nestorian. He's not even, he's not canonical. He does not have a proper Christology. He is not in the church. He may be a nice man. It may be fun to have dinner with him, but that does not make him any type of priest, bishop, or even a Christian. Those are separate concepts. Just because we like somebody, right, doesn't make them a Christian and that certainly does not make them ordained. And just because we don't like somebody, even that we go to church with, doesn't mean that they are not Christians. They are in actuality Christians. They're, these are clear and defined, definite uh, categories of being based on a set of uh, uh, rights that is instituted by the church, right? So when we talk about Christ and the mystical supper, the priesthood that we receive, according to St. Paul, is the priesthood of Christ. The Old Testament priesthood was based on genealogy. So if you were born into a family that you would be a priest, you would be a priest through that basically genealogical uh, uh, circumstance that you were born into, and you'd be elevated to the rank of priest. This is not the case in the church. The case in the church is that those who are priests are priests through the laying on of apostolic hands that has been handed down. This is even what St. Paul says in his epistle where he says, I laid hands on men, right? I appointed, uh, in, in the Greek, he says, I appointed bishops and priests through the ordination and the laying on of hands. This concept is undisputed in the early church. It is an impossibility not to understand this from reading the church fathers. Furthermore, we have a number of miraculous examples of this, including in our iconography, but even in, let's say, the life of St. Siloam the Athenite, which he has one of the most beautiful, which... He talks about being in the confession and the elderly priest, I can't remember his name now, uh, who was a hieromonk, he said his face was transformed, became young, and it was Christ's face hearing confession. There are numerous examples, obviously, even in iconography, of Christ serving the divine liturgy. It is not the priest, when, when I turn my back, everybody thinks that's Father Moses, serving the divine liturgy. That is not the theology of the church. The theology of the church, when we often talk about this concept, theological concept of synergy, is God's energy and man's energy knit together. So when you see me serving the liturgy, is it Father Moses serving the liturgy? Well, yes, of course, right? Of course. And yet, mystically, who is present serving the liturgy? It's actually Christ, right? Because the priest is carrying within him the priesthood of Christ. That is what is handed on to him. That is why, technically speaking, when we look at this from the church fathers, when we talk about what is the height of all of creation, and I'm not saying this because I'm a priest, I'm, I'm saying this because this is very important that we understand this, uh, even uh, everyone understand this, that the height of basically all of creation is the priesthood. Because in the priesthood, Christ is mystically present. This is why also the Holy Fathers say, listen, there, this is why there is so much condemnation 
linked to the priesthood because those who take on the priesthood have to live according to the standard of the priesthood, which is incredibly difficult and will be judged according to the high calling that they have been given. But mystically, Christ is present in every priest. In fact, this is why when we give the blessing and somebody kisses the right hand of the priest, they are not kissing Father Moses's you know, hairy right hand. They are actually carrying, kissing the, the hand of Christ himself. There's a very funny story about this with a, uh, with a monk, who uh, was a priest monk who knew St. Paisios, and St. Paisios said, you know, give me your blessing. And he said, I'm not worthy for you to kiss my hand. And he said, I'm not trying to kiss your hand, right? It's not about the priest. It is about Christ being mystically present. So, these things are all found in the church fathers and they are indisputable. This is the historical teaching of the Orthodox Church. It has, there has never been another teaching. Furthermore, when we talk about Christ being mystically present in the gifts, in the body and blood of Christ, meaning the, the, the bread and the wine, that they, through obviously a miracle, become the actual body and blood of Christ, this is again, this is indisputable. If anybody says, well, this is kind of an innovation, or no, we do it in remembrance, or this is what this verse says, or whatever else, you can tell them, listen, go find me a verse, a, a, a writing in the first 500 years from a church father who is a saint that teaches this understanding that is found in Protestantism. And you can't find it. I've never seen one quote. I've never seen one quote that says that the body and blood of Christ are not actually present mystically in the gifts. Now, when we say mystically, what do we mean when we say that? Well, it kind of unfurls all these things. Obviously, we do not participate in the essence of God. We do not eat the essence of God. Otherwise, we would in fact be God, right? Because God's essence is unknowable except to the triune Godhead. We experience the divine energies of God that come out from him that are in the, the bread and the wine, which is in actuality Christ himself. Now, if you're like, Father, I can't wrap my head around this. That's okay. There's lots of things in the church theologically that Christ imparted to us that we simply cannot wrap our mind around. We cannot wrap our mind around the Trinity. We cannot understand the Trinity. I had, a, I had a, a theology professor who said, if you get to the point where you like understand the Trinity, and he goes, that is the point where you're in heresy. So when you get, you go, we affirm something that we believe that is two degrees unknowable. Three persons, one in essence, undivided, one God. Okay. We do not, we, we don't go, yeah, that, that's just like all these, uh, you know what I mean? There is always a gap in understanding at times between our limited finiteness and God's infinite limitlessness. God is not bound in the same way that we are bound. And so it is when we come to the divine liturgy and we celebrate today the institution of the mystical supper, we are not just celebrating the original, uh, in re we're not remembering today Holy Thursday, right? Does that make sense? We are actually celebrating Holy Thursday. We are actually present with Christ and the disciples. Even if we don't understand, you're like, I don't know if I understand that. It's like, That's okay. It's not about understanding. It is that we have one liturgy. And it was the liturgy that Christ served on Holy Thursday, and that liturgy is in every single liturgy subsequently that has ever been served. Mystically, we are present in that liturgy because it is one. Everyone's just like blank looks. Like it's like Father, it's the end of Lent. <laughs> like it's like we're two days from Pascha. Give us the heaviest theological homily of the whole year. <sighs> So, so, brothers and sisters in Christ, <laughs> we celebrate today this mystical supper with Christ and the apostles, and we travel really with him to Jerusalem in the coming days, and we experience the real resurrection of Christ. 
We don't say Christ was risen. We say Christ is risen. Everything that we do in the church is mystical and outside of time and according to the mind of God and his infiniteness and his ability to see all of time as one. We should never uh, think that when we come to the divine liturgy, we are coming to an earthly event or that we are showing up for something that is happening in Georgetown, Texas. We are showing up to something that is outside of time, mystically having taken place or in reality taking place 2000 years ago, but mystically taking place even today. I pray that uh, this homily has edified you. If nothing else, I hope that you're able to see in your mind how great and glorious God is, how much further his comprehension, his infiniteness, his uncreatedness and the mysticalness of actually knowing him. There are no kind of earthly philosophies or religions that even get within a, a thousand miles of kind of the transcendent reality of how this is all woven together outside of time by the infinite power of God and his mind. All of human religions, all of paganism, all of Islam and Judaism and all these things, all are like bound to the earth to kind of material things in a sense. And they're very low theologically, whereas in the church, all of these things are, are transcendent. They're beyond us, not because we are weak or infantile or this or that, but simply because our minds have not been illumined to them in the fullness of the revelation that we will see one day in the heavenly kingdom. As Christ said in the gospel today, I look forward to partaking or I long or I will not partake again until I do so in the heavenly kingdom. And when people ask what is eternity or what is the age to come, some aspect of the age to come is the eternal divine liturgy whereby we will partake and participate in God and in his energies for all of eternity to his great glory. Amen.